Hey everybody, welcome to this week's Q&As. I'm doing them a day early again because I have a dentist appointment tomorrow and I don't want to be all numb looking like I got punched in the face by Beast or something trying to mumble through a Q&A. So I figured I would do it right now. Uh, there's definitely a few questions. So sorry to do it early two weeks in a row, but hopefully I'll be back on my Thursday afternoon schedule starting next week. But anyway, let's jump in and see what we got. First up on Floatplane, Buster D said they just got a Japanese master system and they were thinking about trying some of the 3D games. Yeah, you absolutely should try it, especially because the 3D adapter is built right in. And basically any active shutter glass with a 3.5 millimeter jack, so the same jack as your headphones, should work without a problem. Now, I haven't tried everyone out there, but the master system, the Famicom ones, the generic ones that you could find on eBay, every one of them worked. And in fact, some of the ones that were sold in the late 90s to go with PC gaming seemed to be a lot more comfortable. They weren't better. It's not going to magically improve the quality of the games or anything like that. But they were lighter. They fit easier on my face. So any 3D glass should work fine as long as it had that 3.5 millimeter jack. And I'm 99% sure it would be safe to just try it. I don't think anything bad would happen. I mean, I, I guess there's a potential of hurting the glasses if... Uh, if they're not wired correctly, but I mean, if you're buying a super cheap pair of glasses as a pair, as opposed to buying an expensive original Master System 3D glasses, it should probably be worth trying out. So I would definitely go for it. Now you mentioned that there's a video out there called the cheapest alternative 3D glasses for the Master System that talked about just modding a headphone cable to an existing set of glasses. Um, I mean, that could work, I guess. But uh, I haven't watched that video, and that's where things would start to get a little weird. I don't know if I would really dig into modding that stuff unless there was no other option. You mentioned you have some spare Samsung and PS3 active 3D glasses. If you're thinking about the wireless versions, I don't know, because uh, then you'd have to deal with power and how does power work with all of that. You don't want to backfeed battery power into a system that's sending it power from you know, the AC to DC converter. So that that's, I would do that as a last resort. I would just try to find any 3.5 millimeter jack based 3D glass, active shutter 3D glasses. Those should just work. Also, <clears throat> just a suggestion, you don't have to listen to me whatsoever for this, but while I love RGB gaming, I would actually try this in composite video as well. Now you have to use the Master System 3D glasses with a CRT. It's not gonna work on a flat panel. Uh, however, I, you know, if you already have an RGB setup, cool. You're not going to be disappointed or anything, but I found that the blending and the natural messiness of composite video really helped the 3D because you saw less ghosting, crosstalk, whatever you want to call it, and it kind of just blended together a little bit better. And if you have a quality CRT, composite video really does look excellent. You know, for years I complained about composite, but I was really just talking about composite video through the scalers that were available at the time on a flat panel, whereas composite on a CRT always looked amazing. So, you know, play these games however you would like, definitely, especially if you invested in a really nice, you know, RGB monitor or something. But if you have a consumer CRT with composite, give that a try too, because I have a feeling for these games, going to be kind of a cool effect. Um, and uh, Maze Hunter 3D, Maze Walker 3D is the Japanese name. Definitely try that one. It's not an easy game. You know, it was definitely one of those games that was made extra hard, so you'd have to keep playing it over and over. Uh, but it uses the 3D effect and the depth of it as part of the game, which I loved. Space Harrier 3D, you just have to. And then OutRun was great too. It wasn't the best version of OutRun and it wasn't the best 3D game, but that was really neat. And uh, yeah, I think those are the ones that you have to try. There's not many, so you could, if you have a ROM cart, you could just try all of them. But I would strongly recommend, if you were going to go out and buy them, Space Harrier 3D just for the hell of it, and Maze, it would be Maze Walker 3D in Japan. But yeah, those are all fun games and definitely worth, at least worth spending a few minutes with. Oh, oh, how could I forget? Missile Defense 3D, an 8-bit 3D light gun game. That is probably the number one if you have a light gun as well, just because it's it's ridiculous. 8-bit missiles firing at your face in 3D. How, you know, how could you not have that one? I can't believe I didn't say that one first. I think that's always my go-to. Maybe that's why it slipped my mind. But anyway, hopefully I'd pointed you in the right direction with that. 
Now moving over to Patreon, Lily wanted to know if I had heard back from anybody about that LCD-based Unicode 26-inch arcade panel firmware update that kind of fixed the resolution issues and any of the other stuff, and no, I haven't. Now, that doesn't mean they didn't release it, but certainly nobody that I know who was talking about it mentioned it to me at all. In fact, most of the people I know got rid of theirs because they just... They didn't, uh, they were just overly disappointed with absolutely everything about it. But hey, I would love to be wrong about this. I enjoy being wrong about stuff like this because I like to talk about happy things. So if anybody hears this in the comments and you own one, did they ever release a firmware update that fixed it? Did they ever offer to send a new driver board out or something like that? Is there any update whatsoever or did people who get those still end up disappointed and just kind of using them as is? Please let us know. I hope it turned around, but I, I don't really have high hopes on that one. Next up, Felipe said, ah, oh, no live Q&A this time to celebrate. I really wanted to do it, but the way my schedule has been the past couple of weeks has been pretty nuts. I'm working on a bunch of behind the scenes projects plus the normal day-to-day -day stuff. So uh, no, not this time, but maybe one of these days I'll be able to just do it live and just say, hey, I didn't get a chance to do this on the 300th, but I'll do it now. Any thoughts on that? Does anybody have any preference or, you know, or anything like that? I think the last time I did it, most people said they loved it, but not all the time, like once a year type of thing, probably do it. So I don't know, maybe I'll, I'll do it with a friend at some point. Maybe I could rope in one of my buddies to do it with me and we could just do it together live. And then I'll edit the audio and re-upload that as an audio only podcast or something. What do you all think? I'm, I'm always open for ideas and I want to do more fun stuff, but I do know a lot of people like the existing format. So I also don't want to mess that up, but yeah, I, I like doing stuff like that at least every once in a while. So let me know what you think. You want me to do it live in a, a week or two or three if I, life gets too crazy and bring a friend on and see what happens? Let me know. Next up, the Remora wants to know if I know anybody who's lag tested the Xtron HDMI matrix switches. They recently stumbled across both a 1080p and 4K one for good prices, and the manual talks about buffering, but doesn't say how much is done. No, I don't, but I would love to know the answer to that myself, and I would also love to know what the compatibility like is with retro. Will a SNES in 5X mode on the OSSC pass through, or will it freak out? How does it work with other HDMI scalers? Um, some of those have issues with certain HDMI matrix chipsets, so I would love to know the answer to all of those things. Does anybody out there have one of those Xtron Crosspoint matrix? Yeah, Crosspoint. I don't know if they're Crosspoints, but they're Xtron HDMI matrix switches. And do you have one of those in a time sleuth that you could just run a couple of tests on? It's super easy. Just stick your time sleuth directly into the upper left corner of your flat panel and just leave it there for like 30 seconds and you know remember what the latency is. And then do the exact same thing, but through the Xtron HDMI matrix switch, make sure to leave it there because sometimes it does, sometimes both TVs and other equipment will buffer for a few seconds and then that's it. I don't know if I would actually call that buffering, but especially with TVs, it takes a moment for the signal to kind of settle down. So just wait and then write down that lag and then minus the first from the second, and that's if any latency is there. Also, if anybody does this, just remember that if you move your hand just a fraction of a millimeter, it'll change the latency. So if your TV has 11 milliseconds of lag and you put it through the Xtron and it has 11.2 milliseconds of lag, I'm almost positive that that's just your hand moving slightly and it's not 0.2 milliseconds. Not that that would matter anyway, but just saying, you know, if, if it's a little bit off, then it's almost surely just the positioning of the time sleuth. Not that that's an issue, just I wanted a good explanation. So nope, I got nothing. And uh, yeah, so if anybody could help with that, I think that would be pretty cool. Next up, some fun ones from Dustin Madison. Um, absolute worst movies I've ever seen in the horror, comedy, and sci-fi genre. So that's such a hard question to answer because there are so many terrible horror movies and some of them are supposed to be terrible and campy and, and you're supposed to kind of laugh with them and at them. So I don't know. That's kind of a hard comedy subjective. There are some movies that all of my friends always thought were funny that I could never stand and some like real cringe comedy. Like my life was cringe. <laughs> like I, whenever I see like Will Ferrell and Ben Stiller movies, it just brings me back to when I did stupid stuff and everybody in the room was staring at me and I was just like, oh, I don't want to watch that. I don't want to relive my my childhood. So uh, that could be anything. And in sci-fi, I don't know. I think there was a bunch of sci-fi that 
kind of in the same way that horror sometimes is a little campy. Some sci-fi people loved that I just didn't really get into or vice versa. I still love the original 1984 Dune. I'm still looking for the Spice Diver version, the latest one, not the AI upscaled one that's floating around, but the latest Spice Diver version in original 24 or 23, 97 frames per second. I, for whatever reason, I can't seem to find that. But yeah, I don't know. I'm terrible at those things because I just... I'm very confident in what I do and don't like, but I'm also very respectful that that's just an opinion. So I'm a terrible person to ask those questions for. You're not really going to get a funny answer from me. You're going to get as lame of an answer as you just got. Sorry. And uh, the, the other kind of silly thing Dustin was talking about is when I was talking about uh, international CRT shipping, the thought was, well, what if we smuggled it inside something? And that is pretty funny. You'd get caught immediately, and it would be annoying as hell. I've had packages I've shipped to people overseas that were like video games inside boxes that got shipped back to me because a laptop was inside. That was the, the stamp that was on it. There was no laptop. There were no electronic components uh, other than the video games themselves, and some were CDs. I had another, I swear on my life this is true, I had an international package come back to me, and it circled the return address and said, return address is missing. But they circled the return address that was a full and complete return address. I, I don't I don't know what drugs they were on, but I would love for them to share them with me because that just seems insane. But uh, yeah, so it would be kind of funny. Imagine like smuggling a CRT inside something that, you know, uh, one legal product inside of another legal product just to be able to get it through. And as much as I'm joking about that, some countries have marked CRTs as e-waste. And if their customs officers are feeling lazy or high like they were when they circled my return address and told me there was none, they could just simply state, I don't want to have to open this thing up and check it. Because, you know, people could smuggle drugs inside a CRT, so they could just mark it e-waste and throw it out. And that doesn't mean, or that doesn't matter what it is. You could send a consumer CRT, or you could send a D32 BVM that, and you've, that you've listed at its full value, and if that customs agent is just in the mood to not deal with it, it could go directly to the garbage and there's nothing you could do about it. So sorry to take your very silly and fun question, Dustin, and just crap all over it. But <laughs> yeah, so, uh, you know, I might have made you laugh thinking about what if you uh, what if you smuggle a CRT, but your comment made me not laugh <laughs> because it just reminded me of all the horrible shipping things I've been dealing with. So not to not to crap on you, Dustin. Hopefully, you, you know, you're taking all of this in, in uh, the silliness that I've meant it as. I'm certainly not getting negative with you or anything. Anything. But yeah, I'm I'm very serious about those returns and what you might have to deal with shipping CRTs internationally. So, whew. Next up, Dr. Lilo wants to know if I could recommend an HDMI switch that actually works for 4K 120 HDR VRR that they could put at the end of a long signal chain without the signal dropping out or failing to get through. One of the HDMI ports on their TV just died and they need a reliable solution that just works 100% of the time, and it needs to work with particularly fussy sources like PS5 and PC. Dr. Lilo, I am going to be useless to you. Uh, I've got nothing. I prefer to test cheap stuff because I want to be able to recommend this to people. So while I could ask a friend to borrow a $700 HDMI switch that has everything you need, I just normally don't because not almost nobody is going to have the budget to go out and get something like that. And even if you did, um, you know, the higher end products should be easier to find. And if you buy something for that amount of money, that should be very easily returnable. What I would suggest is to get one or two from Amazon and then just be honest. Just say, hey, I tested this. Leave a, leave a review, an honest review either way and just see what happens. I'm still looking into the next generation of HDMI equipment, you know, the HDMI 2.1 matrix switches, splitters, and all of that, but almost every one that I've tried has some issue with it. And some issue, I don't even, I'm not even talking about 120 hertz and VRR, I'm talking about compatibility issues, signal drops, audio pops, things that shouldn't happen. So hopefully some company out there will start to make good ones at a reasonable price, but I've got nothing for you. I'm sorry. If anybody in the comments would be, or would care to recommend anything, just once again, please remember that YouTube almost always auto deletes links. It doesn't even show up in my held for review bin. So if you happen to have a switch, please spell out the name of it. Like 
brand model and then, you know, available on Amazon, AliExpress, eBay, whatever else, but don't put the URL. And even if that gets flagged, I should be able to find that in my bin and just, you know, just say release it and everything. But yeah, sorry, Dr. Lilo, got nothing for you, but hopefully uh, other people who are listening might be able to help us. Next up, Koala Koa wanted to chime in on the question about polishing products. Before we do though, I'm still testing with Koala what the issue was with the cross point. That seemed to work fine once a different cable was used. So it could possibly just be that we got bum cables. It could be that one of them turned out to be a sink on Luma and the other one had something wrong with it. But we'll follow up on that eventually. But I, I think that was just bad luck and two bad cables, which made it seem like there was a problem with the cross point, but it turned out to not be. But anyway, going through what Koala said, um, they have family members with the car detailing business and they've had access to and have used every single car product you can imagine on their consoles and junk ones. There are specific procedures for nearly every plastic type. As you can imagine, textured versus shiny, shiny versus matte. This is not a one-stop all product. For shiny consoles, the best method is following the detailer steps. Clean, then polish using a cut product and mild heat to remove and smooth some of the paint or, pla or plastic. Then polish until a glossy finish. You could also cut polish and then prep for the respray of a clear coat layer. This works exceptionally well on a PS3 Piano Black. For products, they've found less abrasive brands work best. While over-the-counter brands are cheap, they contain sand or small particles of rocks to scratch the surface. Rubes and its many products are highly suggested, and they'd be willing to show a comparison video demonstrating the different products on different surface levels. If you ever do post a video, let me know. I'll repost it on Retro RGB. That's definitely an in-depth and cool thing to show. Continuing, though, for textured consoles, do not use a cut product as it will remove the surface texture and feel what they could only explain as dull. For removal of scratches on textured consoles, the best method is proper cleaning, then a Q-tip or needle cotton tip to repaint like a model kit or resin statue. You could just uh, use just a polish, but that will depend on heat meltdown, uh, on heat meltdown the texture at least a little bit. For cleaning plastics, they use ammo products from Larry in New York. Hell yeah, love, love that channel and all of those products. Uh, they're not cheap, but the pH balance is what they care about. They follow with a plastic shine using plain old original pledge with orange. It provides a semi-gloss shine with a nice smell. For matte consoles, you want oil-free cleaners as the oils will leave a semi-shine and will stain the plastic permanently. An example would be the Xbox Series X and PS2. So yeah, that's that's pretty cool. I think you can get really insanely in depth with that. And I appreciate the general knowledge. I'd love to see a super deep dive video. Maybe you could work with one of the other bigger channels to make sure that the video really gets seen. Maybe Tito or My Life in Gaming or somebody would be willing to work with you and kind of do a video on this to get this info out to as many people as possible. Because I think it's, it's really good info. And I think people would really want a good step-by-step -step process for each type of console. Like imagine a real high production video from you know any of those channels where it shows close-ups and macro shots of the plastics and describes which are which and even goes into which consoles are which. I mean, you could probably make an hour long video at least based on this and you know, if, if it was shot in their style, it would feel like a 10 minute video just because, you know, you know how they pace their videos. Very awesome. So yeah, thank you very much for sharing all this stuff. And it's fun, it's fun to always hear other people who know about the weird YouTube channels I follow sometimes like Ammo NYC and all that stuff. Larry really gets into it and he cracks me up. His level of OCD matches some of the nerdiest nerds in retro gaming. So I love and admire people who go real deep with stuff like that. So yeah, thanks very much, Koala. Next up, a couple of questions from Christopher Zurich. Did I get that right? Was I close? I'm sorry, but my apologies if I didn't. I try real hard. But anyway, first, how can you send an RGB signal through an Extron Matrix crosspoint to both a PVM and a consumer-grade CRT with SCART? So the problem here is that a consumer-grade PAL CRT with a SCART connector is almost surely going to need voltage to enable RGB and that input on it. Some TVs have manual settings where you could just plug RGBS and audio into it and you don't need anything else, but others will not work at all unless they detect some kind of voltage on the voltage pin. So what I would probably suggest doing is making yourself a custom BNC to SCART cable. BNC on the Extron crosspoint end and then SCART with, uh, make sure it's directional and then 
where you're supposed to get voltage. Double check the exact voltage that it's supposed to be listed as, and then get yourself a cheap uh, PSU and wire it to those pins on the SCART connector. It's going to be a pain. And if you need multiple consumer CRTs, like maybe you're building a CRT wall, you could try to do something like have one PSU go to multiple SCART adapters, but that's probably a good way to go about doing it. Um, I would just double and triple check everything because obviously you don't want to send voltage down a pin that's going to video or audio or something like that, but that should accomplish what you're looking to do. The only problem is then you would need, if, if you were going to use that CRT for something else, then you would need a way to turn the voltage off when that wasn't in use. I think you would at least. Um, but if you're talking about a dedicated gaming setup when the only time you're powering on the CRT is to, to game on it, I guess. Even if you power up the PBM, but not the consumer CRT, if you still have the, tw uh, I think it's 12 volts or five volts. I forgot what it was. Please double check all this. I have basically zero experience with PAL CRTs, but just if you just had the proper voltage going to it, even when the TV was off, that shouldn't make a difference at all. So that's how I would go about doing it that way. Um, but you're going to have to customize it. And you're probably going to have an issue having somebody else make this for you because most cable makers are going to say, no, I'm not putting voltage down, down a line for you. I'm not handing you an AC to DC power brick and telling you to plug that into your TV. So it's probably going to be something that you have to do on your own, but I would look into it. Next question. They have a CRT projector, uh, but don't manage to use their direct video uh, Mr. FPGA with RGB and BNC on it. Could it be a sync problem? So, um, you know, those are always, that's always going to be an iffy thing to do because direct video runs at a super resolution. So you have over 2000 pixels wide, but uh, this normal 240 pixels tall, which CRTs should just detect. It could be a sync issue. It could be your settings, but what I would I would kind of go through the steps and double and triple check your projector and see if there's anything else going on, including your direct video adapter into your PVM and see what's happening. So basically, if you have RGBS going into your PVM and that works perfectly, but it's not working through your CRT projector, you're going to have to look into other stuff. You could try looking into getting one of Greg's adapters if you want an easy plug and play way to get component video out instead of RGBS. That could potentially help you out. But I don't have, I have almost zero direct, uh, direct hands on experience with CRT projectors. I would love another one. Um, I would love to try it out here. I would love to run a lot of those tests that I ran on that stream that got deleted the other day on a CRT projector, especially things like 72 and 96 hertz and things like that. And a buddy of mine had an idea about how to run 3D through it. It's just a whole bunch of stuff I'd love to test, but. I don't have the ability to. So, hey, if you live around New York City and you got an extra CRT projector, I'll meet you and, uh, you know, for a fair price. But at this point, I actually have to sell some monitors coming up. So I wouldn't be able to spend much on it anyway. So, I, you know, other than basic troubleshooting, I wouldn't really be able to help on the CRT projector. But hopefully, I was able to help a little bit with the consumer CRT. A couple of kind of funny things from Kirk. First, they stay in a lot of hotels for work and needed to sell, tell someone who might care that every single TV they use in the motels they stay at, they make sure to turn off motion smoothing. They've stayed in the same room a year apart and it was left turned off. They feel like they're doing some sort of community service. I love it. Almost every single person listening to this is going to love it too. So thank you for that, Kirk. <laughs> On an unrelated note, uh, if anyone has is watching this in New South Wales, Australia, uh, can help them with a non-functioning BVM 20 F1E monitor, please let Kirk know. Uh, so if anybody in that area can help, uh, you know, please chime in in the comments. If not, Kirk, if like a week goes by, let me know, and I could probably put you in touch with some of my fellow BVM nerds out on your island, and hopefully they'd be able to either help or point you in the right direction. Um, and also, Kirk said congrats on the upcoming 400th roundup. They've listened to every single episode that's been available. Oh, I'm sorry. The earlier ones weren't that great. These aren't aren't super great either, but I'd like to think I got at least a little bit better over the years. So thanks for sticking with me. 
Next up, Weaselow just picked up a Tink 4K this last weekend, and they're trying to figure out how to integrate it in their setup that has a G-Comp switch with one output going to a retro Tink 5X and another going into a consumer CRT. The Tink 5X is currently connected to a 1080p plasma that they hope to continue to use with that scaler. So there's a bunch of right ways that you could deal with this, and the only wrong way would really be to use Y cables on the component video lines. You definitely don't want to do that at all. Uh, other than that, what I would suggest maybe at first is to replace the Tink 5X with the 4K for now. Set the def uh, default resolution to 1080p, and then when you go to use it with your 4K TV, you could just set the resolution to 4K, but if not, it defaults to 1080p, so you won't be sending improper resolution to your current plasma screen. And then when the time comes to switch to only one display, you could then keep the Tink 5X for the plasma separately to that. If you want them all hooked up at the same time, then I would get uh, just search eBay or maybe even Amazon or something for component video distribution amp. It would probably be a one in four out scenario. And that is the type of thing that would safely split the image. There could be some signal degradation. So I would put that into the consumer CRT and the Tink 5X and then put the direct output of the G-Comp into the Tink 4K just to make sure there's absolutely no signal loss whatsoever going into the highest resolution processor. But you shouldn't have a, too much of a trouble finding that. Uh, those should be pretty cheap. You can get decommissioned older equipment. There should be some cheaper stuff on Amazon that probably is not going to be terrible, but certainly safe to try. Or if you really wanted to, you could, uh, if you wanted everything set up at the same time, you could replace your G-Comp with an Extron Crosspoint and then just get a giant bag of RCA to BNC connectors and run all your component video stuff through that. And then you can get like a uh, 8 or 12 in, 4 or 8 out uh, cross point, so you could have all that stuff hooked up at the same time, plus room for a lot more. The only downside of cross points is you have a lot more wires jammed in back, they're older equipment, so at some point the caps are going to die on them. So it's really up to you. There's a bunch of totally good solutions here, and you know, I gave you a couple, but let me know if, uh, if anything, if nothing I said helps, let me know what other details you could give me that I could try to figure out some way to get this into your setup that'll work with everything, but hopefully I'm at least aiming you in the right direction. Next up, Jason Guffey has a coworker that really just wants to play Duck Hunt on their modern big flat panel TV, and they want an easy way to do so. Well, there is an easy way. There might be some complications, as there always are, but there was that project LCD mod from a few way, uh, LCD mod, I think it was. I'll leave a link to it, but it was from a couple years ago, and it modified the ROM of Duck Hunt to be able to calibrate to the lag of your display and have it work on a modern flat panel. Only some guns were compatible and you needed a ROM hack for it, but Hyperkin reached out and with the permission of the creator, they're now bundling a product that's 40 bucks that is a light gun that's compatible with it and a device that kind of looks like a Game Genie that you plug your Duck Hunt or Mario Duck Hunt combo card into, plug that into your NES and that should allow it to work. Now, the only downside is if you have one of those terrible adapters with tons of rolling latency, that would be an issue because it's never going to be the same uh, the same amount of latency twice. So it would be very hard to do that. So I would suggest getting like a RetroTink 2X Pro and one of these. So you're basically talking about 200 bucks to play Duck Hunt on an original console on a flat panel. And it's going to be fine. It's not going to be as accurate as a CRT, but it'll definitely work. Now, that's a bit of money if you want to do that. I mean, if the flat panel has composite video inputs, try it. But as always with stuff like this, just present realistic expectations. That Hyperkin thing might not work properly with that, but if you set it up with a scaler, maybe it would. So I, if I were in your position, I would tell your coworker to buy this. I'll leave a link in the description. It's probably going to be an affiliate link because I'm not a moron. Why would, I, why would I skip the ability to make four cents on a, on a sale? Uh, but start with that and see what happens. And if it's unplayable, then find some sort of gaming scaler that's going to work that doesn't suck. The 
2X Pro is probably going to be the best bet for something like that, but maybe you could find a used mini or something like that. Who knows? But I would definitely start with that and go from there because you could dig into emulation and stuff like that, but you're going to spend more. If you have to get like a Sindon light gun and figure out a PC or a laptop, and then you're going to have to calibrate it. I mean, when you really start digging into what it takes to do this stuff, most people lose interest immediately, or by the time they get to playing their game, they only have a few minutes left, and it's like... All right, adult real life kicked in. That was fun. And then they never do it again. Whereas if they're plugging it into their flat panel, they could leave that NES in their setup. So it's aesthetic. It's neat. It's kind of one of those conversation points where people come over like, oh, I had one of those. And and you could just use Duck Hunt and it'll be totally passable. So yeah, I'll leave a link to the Hyperkin thing as well as the original project if anybody's interested. And uh, if you have a flat panel and a ROM cart and one of these guns, you could just try it and see what happens. Next up, the dressing gown is looking to start doing some preventative maintenance on their consoles. And they've already done cap replacements on motherboards, but now they're looking to start doing cap replacements on power supplies. So they're looking for any kind of advice or tips. So, I mean, the number one thing I could tell you is don't touch it when it's still plugged into the wall. As silly as that is, that's honestly the, the only thing I would really mention. You know, if you, uh, like on a PlayStation 1, right, unplug the power from the wall. Once you get in there, maybe after the power is unplugged, press the power button a couple times to discharge any of the caps. If they were already charged, you'd probably just get a slight DC zap anyway, so I, I wouldn't worry about that too much. It'd probably kind of be more like touching a battery than anything else, but, you know, press the button to discharge them, and that's really it. If you're using cap replacement kits from a reputable store like Console 5, then you don't really have to worry about anything. If you're going to make your own capacitor kits, that's the only time I would just take a moment to double and triple check each one. Is it a normal cap, or does it look different? If it looks different, what's different about it and why? And do you need to order a different type of capacitor to replace it with? But if you're just getting cap replacement kits, I wouldn't worry about it at all. The only other issue would be wall warts. So the SNES power supply is a giant pain to, to get apart to the point where I just give them to my modern friends and for free and just say, here you go, replace the cap, fix it, sell it, whatever. And I just get a triad for those. Whereas the Genesis ones, I think was just one screw and there was some glue, but a little bit of wiggling. And I got that apart. I you know read the capacitor, um, the exact level. I replaced it with another one and that was it. So... It's, it's certainly not nearly as scary as designing a power supply circuit or working on a CRT that hasn't been discharged yet. I, I, as long as, you know, as long as the power supply itself is discharged, which would only take a few seconds leaving it unplugged from the wall anyway, you don't really have anything to worry about. And just try to stick to cap kits from reputable places if you're not 100% sure about if there's a different type of cap on the power supply or something. But overall, I think you, you wouldn't have a problem with it, especially if you've already done cap replacements on main boards. Well, that's mostly it for this time. Just a couple other very small things. First of all, sorry if I did these too early and other people missed their questions like they had the past couple times. I just really didn't want to do this tomorrow with a swollen face mumbling through it. I really do enjoy doing these and I don't want to miss. I mean, I, I try my best to do as good as I can and and I really hope that this is kind of a fun thank you to all the supporters. So I just, I didn't want to do it all swollen and weird or anything like that. Uh, also, in another apology, there was a question last week that the question was perfectly fine. The person who asked it, I already reached out to and apologized, but I ended up deleting it and re-uploading the Q&A before it went public because while I was catching some crap for it, most importantly, I did make a mistake. I said a video was deleted that was not deleted. I just couldn't find it. So I didn't want to have my answer, which I still stand by every word I said, but that one mistake would have badly reflected on somebody who didn't deserve it. So I just thought it was the right thing to do to delete it. And also, I really got to pick and choose my battles because, you know, the the more the more people you interact with, the, the more good and bad situations you're going to run into. And if I say something that's 100% true, backed with fact and colored with some of my opinions, but nobody gains anything from it and I have to eat a whole bunch of shit for saying it, it's useless. It's just a waste of everybody's time. So I just, I didn't want to have to deal with it. I figure I will just stick to things. If I have to say something negative, then I'm going to say it in the context where it means something. You know, hey, this product's great, but only use it here. And you know, this product's 
cool too, but like stuff that actually is important to the people listening is where I need to, those are the arguments I need to stand by. Um, and uh, you know, that's still going to upset a lot of people. I just had a company I've been working with for a long time, lose their, lose their shit on a forum because the past couple of reviews I did of products that were already shipping in customers' hands were bad reviews. And I posted all of my facts. I double and triple checked the work. I followed back up on it. I followed up with them and they were just mad that their products have gone to crap and they took it out on me. And that's the type of argument that I need to stand by because it's not like somebody sent me a prototype. Like picture this, right? You're making a product. You send me a prototype. I find stuff wrong with it. I tell you, I tell you the facts and I tell you the opinions and then I let you do what you want with it. I would never make that information public unless you said, screw you, Bob, you're lying and released it anyway. But like, if you fixed those problems, I would never talk about it because why, why would I? That's You've done nothing but improve upon a product and everything's cool. But if you're already shipping products to customers, people are plugging them in and using them with their equipment, then the information has to be out there. And I just, I don't understand how anybody could be upset by that. But you know, I, I guess it it sucks knowing that you screwed up and there's nothing you could do about it. And sometimes if I need to be the punching bag, that that's fine. But I just, I'm really trying to pick and choose the arguments that I get into. And stuff like that is worth it because people need to know that the products that they make or that they've bought already might not be up to par. But if it's just my opinions on a situation and I'm going to get a whole bunch of crap from a whole bunch of different places on it, what's the point of that, right? Even if it might add some perspective to, to people, it's just all I'm going to do is just deal with negativity for no reason. So because of the actual mistake I made and because of that, I decided to you know delete the section. But for other stuff, I'm always going to leave it in there. And I would love to be just the happy, jolly, Santa-esque, drunk Bob type of person that never says anything negative. But that would be useless to you because then you would not know the things to avoid. Like imagine if I never talked about pound cables or that SCART to HDMI adapter, you know, how would that help you in your setup? So I'm going to still talk about stuff when I need to, but I, I'm just going to try to avoid uh, avoid it when I don't because it's just been really frustrating lately. Even with uh, with certain situations, even when I post nice complimentary things, Next thing you know, I'm getting dogpiled on because people just assume that I mean something else by it. So, yeah, it is what it is. But you are all awesome, and I appreciate all of you, and thank you for participating. Thank you for supporting. I really do enjoy doing these. And uh, once again, to the person who I had to not answer your question, I, you didn't do anything wrong, and I apologize again. That's not fair to you, but I made a mistake, and I was just being lazy and didn't want to deal with a bunch of crap again. So... Sorry to all of you, but also thank you. So uh, I will see you all next week. And you know, I'll also take your feedback on any other live or fun stuff if you want to see that. Maybe I could try that again at some point. But anyway, I'll see you soon. Thanks again.